Good morning. Welcome to River Springs. We're glad you're here. Y'all stand up and worship with us.
morning. morning. Welcome to River Springs. We're so glad you're here. Y'all sit down for just a moment. I'm going to talk to you for just a minute. Welcome to River Springs. If this is your first time with us today or your, your 10,000th time, well, I'm so glad to see you. I thank you for coming. Welcome. I just want to go over just a couple of things with you real quick. Um, if this is your first time with us, we would love to connect with you. We would love to have an opportunity um, to just, uh, I'd love, what I'd love to do is send you a note. I'd love to maybe send you a text or something, just let you know how much that I appreciate you coming today. Um, I want to make you a promise, two promises. I promise I won't come see you <laughs> unless you want me to. And I promise I will not let anybody else do it either. So what I'm going to ask you to do, if this is your first time with us or if we've never connected at all, what I'm going to ask you to do is right in the seat in front of you, there's a, there's a connection card. There's a card in there. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to, is to give me some of your information. What I'd love to do is just be able to say thank you for coming to River Springs. And the way I would do that is, first of all, I've got a free gift for you. And second of all, I'd love to send you a card this week. I'd love to send you a note and just say that my name's Jimmy. This is my phone number. And if you need me, you can call me. And to, to, to connect like that, all you have to do is reach up in the seat in front of you and pick out that connection card. A little later in the service, a, a basket's going to come by. You can drop it in the basket. Or if you want a free gift, we've got a gift for you. You can take it out to the information table outside the welcome table and just, just put it in. Who's going to be out there? Oh, it's going to be Miss Anderson. She's, uh, she's going to be out there. You can take it to, to Haley and say, uh, we, uh, this is our first time, or we'd love to connect with you. And she's got a free gift waiting on you. So that's what we would ask you to do, unless you're like a, a maybe a digital person. If you would rather do this digitally, you can also do it via text message. You could text the word welcome to 3730133, and we could connect that way. And, and I would appreciate that so very much. So it would just give me an opportunity to put a name with your face later in the week just to, uh, to reach out to you and let you know how much I appreciate you coming to River Springs Church. Just a couple of things I want to tell you about uh, the life of River Springs Church. Also, I guess, wanna th I guess I want to thank some of you, a whole bunch of you, for coming yesterday to help with the Tiny Treasures ministry. We had a huge uh, outpouring out yesterday. They did so much great work was done in here yesterday. Um, I, I hope you saw it on, on Facebook or, or, or some other social media. It was, uh, it was a great time. Lots of great ministry was done. Thank you so much for, for those who were leading it, those who were taking part in it, and those who were praying about it because a lot of cool stuff was done in here in support of, of uh, premature babies and, and stillborns as well. So thank you so much for your ministry. It is, it is well-placed and well-needed uh, for those folks. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for participating. Um, I want to tell you about what's coming up next weekend. Next weekend is our students' chicken dinner. It's our yearly world famous, uh, all that jazz. It's delicious. It's fantastic. But you can't just show up and eat chicken. You got to buy a ticket. So you will find a station out in the lobby to buy a ticket to the chicken dinner. So make sure before you leave here today that you secure your ticket because you're going to need it. You don't want to miss this chicken dinner. I'm telling you, every time we have a chicken dinner, people will say, I wish I got more tickets because that chicken was good. It's just it's fantastic, and you don't want to miss it. It's sat what time is it next Saturday, Heather? It's from 5 to 7 on Saturday the 28th, and you need a ticket. Tickets are out in the lobby. Make sure you, you get some information about it before you leave because you're not going to miss it. You're not going to want to miss it. It's a great time. And and it's raising money for our students ministry for the for the stuff the cool stuff that they do over the the summer for the for the the beach retreat they'll be going on and also the mission trip that they'll do, they'll be doing uh, to Puerto Rico. You heard about a little bit about our trip. You'll hear more about the trip that some adults took last week in the coming weeks and we'll also be telling you about the trip that our students will be taking uh, to Puerto Rico coming in the summer. Lots of great ministry to be done there as you know. We uh we we've been praying for our friends in Puerto Rico since uh, Maria came through. Uh, back in the fall, and they are still still in recovery mode down there, and they can still use our prayers, and they still definitely need our hands and feet um, as we go and minister to them. So uh, I'll, I'll, I would appreciate if you would uh, support that support that chicken dinner. I want to tell you about one more thing going on here. Uh, you will see a handsome, really tall young man floating around with a camera. Um, it's not weird. Don't be a, don't be alarmed. We're working on some new promotion around here, so I don't want it to freak you out. Uh, so he's going to maybe take your picture today. Uh, don't don't worry about it. We're not gonna. S well, we might sell it. No, we're not gonna sell it. I'm kidding. He he may take some. He's want to take some candid pictures around here of people worshiping. So um, we're gonna take some pictures today. He's also gonna be maybe asking some of you to 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 speak for a couple minutes on camera. Doesn't have to be today. But in the coming weeks, he might ask you to do 15 or 20 seconds about why you love your church. So uh, don't be uh, don't be freaked out when uh, when my friend Dalton comes and says, Hey, would you be interested in in uh, in getting on camera for a minute? Uh, he is, he is a, he's got the check of approval from me. He's not just doing this, okay. Um, 
thank you so much for coming to River Springs Church today. We love you, and we are glad you're here. You could be anywhere else in the world, and you've chosen to come here today, and that means a lot to me, and that means a lot to us, and we, we just covet the opportunity to worship with you. We're going we're gonna to sing praise together. Uh, there's nothing that I love singing more about than the reckless love of Almighty God and, and the distance that he has come to be with us, that he came, that he sent Jesus, and that he is still with us. And so we're going to sing about that today. We're going we're gonna to take joy in that today. Uh, but first, the boys and girls are going to go out. The boy, boy, boys and girls, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade are going to Kids Club. Kids Club meets down the hall, and they'll be back after the message today. So uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is don't leave them, okay? Now, they'll come in here sometime after the message. They'll find you as long as you don't change seats. I'm looking at some of you specifically. That's right. <laughs> no kidding. Would y'all stand with us and worship?
We sometimes don't. We sometimes forget about life and health and strength and the fact that those things are so fleeting. We forget about them. So help us not to forget. The cry of our heart is thank you. Thank you that we are able to fill our lungs, that we are able to stand upright, that you have given us life, that we can sing. Thank you for putting a song in our heart. Thank you for your power and your majesty and your grace and your goodness. God, we thank you that you came near that when I was your foe still your love fought for me not when I was just some guy that maybe didn't quite know Jesus yet no no I was way worse than that I was many many miles from you many many miles from you and yet you came yet you loved yet you gave and there's a song in my heart because of that So we cry out. We sing out. Take joy in what you hear, we pray. The cry of our heart is to bring you praise today, so we will and we do. We come to that place where we give you tithes and offerings. God, we don't want to just skip right over these moments. Help us meditate on you. We thank you for the ways you've blessed us. We thank you for all you've given to us. We pray you would bless these tithes, bless these offerings to the, to the building of your kingdom, to the feeding of hungry people, to the salving of broken hearts, to the mending of broken lives. Help us to be your hands and feet, to make a difference in this community, in this state, in this world. You've put us here for a reason. Now use us, God. Use us, we pray. And we say all these things in the precious, strong name of Jesus. song's called All the Poor and Powerless. And I, I believe that, that you will find yourself in the song somewhere. All the poor and powerless, all the lost and lonely, all the thieves will come confess. And then the second verse is all, who heart, all the hearts who are content and then all who feel unworthy. I think you'll find yourself somewhere in there today. So if you do, like me, let this be the cry of your heart today. Would y'all stand with us?
and all the hearts who are content, and all who feel unworthy, and all who heard with nothing left, will know that you are holy, and all. Be seated.
I suppose week maybe 17 of the story. And uh, let me just catch you up on where we are. Or First of all, let me invite you to join us. If you have not been with us so far, we would love to have you join us in the story. It is, uh, it is not too late to start. You can start right now, and you can jump right in, and uh, it'll, be just, it'll be just great. We're, we're finishing out 1 Samuel this week, starting 2 Samuel, and um, there's plenty and plenty and plenty of great stuff left for you, so please jump in now. Uh, there's, uh, there's three ways to get involved. First way is there's a Google Calendar, or, or there's a paper plan on the back, which is the Google Calendar. You can find the Google Calendar on our webpage, riversprings.org. It's at the bottom says reading plan. You just click right on that and it'll take you to the reading plan. Um, or you could go to version. The version plan is called the chronological plan. So that's three ways you could get involved if you are interested. Uh, today's notes are also located uh, on the website, riversprings.org. You'll find that listed under today's sermon notes. So just to catch you up on where we are, we have, uh, I, say, I keep saying we like we're the Israelites. We have j- Gone into the promised land. We've been waiting for a long, long time to make it into the land of Canaan. So we're in Canaan now. Cool deal, right? So we're in Canaan. And we have come through the period of the judges. And and the people weren't happy. They wanted a king. So they really, 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 really wanted a king. And God said, you don't really want a king. And they said, yeah, we do want a king. And God's like, no, you don't want a king. They're like, yeah, we do want a king. And so he gave him a king. King Saul came along, and, and as we see, King Saul, <laughs> last week we looked at how, still, there we go, we looked at uh, King David being anointed. So he was anointed, we looked at uh, uh, Samuel going and finding King David, right? And then in chapter 17, we looked at the story of David and Goliath, really cool story. And so that kind of, that's where we kind of left off last week. And so to basically to sum things up, Saul is king, but he's not going to be king much longer because God's favor has left him. He's been a wicked king. He's been a self-serving king. And so God's favor has left him. He has chosen David to be the next king, right? David's going to be the next king. David has God's favor. But we're in that time in between. Saul's still king. David's going to be king. And so it's kind of, a, kind of a transition period there for the people. Okay? So it's a transition period. We looked at what that means to be in a transition period last week, right? How God is preparing you wherever you are for what you've got next. So he's preparing David to be king now, even though David is not yet king. And so today, we're going to be looking at one of the stories before David is king, after he's anointed, before he's king. And it takes place in the book of 1 Samuel, you guessed it, chapter 25. So if you got your Bible, you can go ahead and open it up there because basically the whole message is out of chapter 25. It's a story that um, if you have not read through the Bible before, like the whole Bible cover to cover, you may have never read this story. And so as I read it last week, I loved it. I thought it was a great story. And I said, we need to talk about this on Sunday morning because it's a story that's not all that familiar as opposed to last week's story, David and Goliath, that You've heard 700,000 times, whether you've been in church or not, you know the story of David and Goliath. Well, this week, we're talking about a different character, a little more secondary character, maybe not a secondary character, but a character you don't know about so well. We're going to look at this character. And the story is unusual because this character, who is the central character, the main character, is, in fact, a woman. The main character of this story turns out to be the woman. See, we're in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a product of a highly patriarchal culture, right? In the Middle East, we can look now and still see that there's a whole lot of the patriarchal society going on over there. Women are treated very differently than they are now, even a few thousand years ago. So with few exceptions, women are... Almost always secondary characters at best in the Old Testament. Except today. Except this story. This is one of the few that we find a woman as our central character. And so I wanted to spend some time on it today. Because this lady we're going to look at today is a lady of great character. Of remarkable intelligence. And the story's a great one. Okay? The lady's name is Abigail. If you don't know Abigail, you're going to learn about her today. It's a great story. It's a great story about a woman named Abigail. So just to kind of catch you up, we're going to talk about Abigail today. But before we introduce her to her, King, King Saul, King-elect David maybe, I don't know what you call him. But Saul doesn't like David. 
They were friends for a minute, but then Saul started to get jealous of David. Okay, he started to, to, to not like um, David he, in the wake of David's victory over Goliath and then some victories over the Philistines. David started to gain some renown amongst the people. Saul didn't like that very much. Saul started to grow jealous. Once David returned from victory on the battlefield and the people said this, David, uh, Saul has struck down thousands, but David has struck down tens of thousands. Why, I mean, so he's just ready-made jealousy right there. And so Saul is, in fact, jealous. The irony of it is that David is fighting on behalf of Saul. Saul's king. Saul gets all the glory. Saul gets the spoils of war, but Saul doesn't see it that way. He could not stand the fact that David was receiving some glory. And as time goes on, Saul's jealousy grows, his contempt for David grows, and he begins to try to kill him. On multiple occasions, he tries to kill David. Then in chapter 23, David has an opportunity to kill Saul. He gets a drop on Saul, but he doesn't. He shows mercy to him. But in the wake of this little episode where, where uh, David shows mercy to Saul, David runs. David gets away from him. He takes about 600 men and they get out of Dodge because David is eventually either going to have to strike down Saul or he's going to be struck down by Saul. And David doesn't want any part of that. He doesn't want to have to be the one to do that. So David leaves. David runs. And then we start, the verse, uh, start chapter 25. We see in verse 1 that Samuel dies. And all the country is in mourning. Everybody knows Samuel. Everybody loves Samuel. David loved him very much. So David's on the run. David's been, he's, he's been uh, attempted murdered. What do you call that? He's been attempted to be killed. I, uh, Saul's tried to kill him a couple times. He's had mercy on him. He's running. His, his mentor is dead. It's a tough time for David. It's a tough, tough time for David. So he's on the run. And so that's where we are. Starting in verse, uh, chapter 25. That's where we are. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at this story kind of like it's a Quentin Tarantino movie. Does anybody watch Quentin Tarantino movies? Anybody know that? Anybody know Tarantino? You know, one of Tarantino's things when he does a movie is there's always that black title screen. And it's like act one or chapter one or part one. You know what I'm talking about? Well, that's what we're going to do this story today. It's four distinct acts to this story. So just to pretend like you're seeing the black screen, like in front of your face, here's part one. It's the foolishness of Nabal. Nabal, N-A-B-A-L. That's the dude. The foolishness of Nabal. The story unfolds in four distinct parts, four distinct acts. And the first part, the first act, the first scene is the foolishness of Nabal. So let's open up the Bible now. Let's open up the Scripture, whether you are in a paper Bible if you want one, there's some at the back. Or whether you're using a device or a tablet, you can turn your Bible on. If it helps you, it's, uh, it's page 712 in my... No, it's not. I'm kidding. 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 2. A man in Maon had a business in Carmel. He was a very rich man with 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. I'm going to stop right there. I don't know how rich you have to be to, to be rich. I don't know how many sheep and goats you got to have. But he had enough that he passed rich. He was on in the very rich category. He had lots of stuff, okay? He had 3,000 sheep, 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. When it says he was shearing his sheep, he wasn't shearing his sheep. He had, he had some guys coming in and shearing his sheep. He had sheep shearers, right? He, he's not a, he don't dirty. He's getting dirt on his fingernails and wool on your hands. No, he ain't doing that. The man's name was Nabal, or if he was in the south, it'd be Nabal, but it's Nabal. His wife's name was Abigail. The woman was intelligent and beautiful. But the man, a Calebite, was harsh and evil in all his dealings. You know what a Calebite means, right? What is a Calebite? In the, from the family of Caleb. Very good. Remember Caleb? Caleb was one of the spies. He was the minority report, the ones that said, we can take the promised land. So we, we love Caleb. Caleb's a good guy, but he's got this jerk face in his family. He was harsh and evil in his dealings. While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So David sent ten young men, instructing them, go up to Carmel. And when you come to Nabal, greet him in my name. Then say this, long life to you and peace to you, to your family and to all that is yours. I hear that you are shearing. When your shepherds were with us, we didn't harass them. 
Nothing of theirs was missing the whole time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. So let my young men find favor with you, for we have come on a feast day. Please give whatever you can afford to your servants and to your son David. So David's young men went and said all these things to Nabal on David's behalf, and they waited. Nabal asked them, Who is David? Who is Jesse's son? Many slaves these days are running away from their masters. Am I supposed to take my bread and my water and my meat that I butchered for my shears and give them to these men? I don't know where they're from. We'll stop right there. So we find that David and his men are on the run, right? He and his 600 fighting men are on the run. They have moved west from the Dead Sea across the mountains into the desert of Moan. And what they have found is a man named Nabal and his flocks. While they were there, they were kind to Nabal and his flocks. They protected Nabal and his flocks. It was not uncommon for marauding bandits to come through and take a sheep when they wanted one. Take a goat when they needed one. Steal kill but David and his men looked out for him they offered protection we're told that Nabal was a very rich man in Hebrew the word Nabal means fool the foolishness foolishness of Nabal is going to come pretty clear pretty quickly right he had a wife named Abigail Abigail means in Hebrew source of joy we see in verse 3 that she is intelligent and she is beautiful. What a contrast, right? This is like proof positive that love is blind, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable. This mean-spirited jerk is married to an intelligent and beautiful woman. I did it too, but I mean, just saying. <laughs> this story takes place at sheep shearing time. Let me tell you about sheep shearing time. Sheep shearing time was a time that generosity was supposed to reign. It was like an unwritten rule. It was a custom. When you sheared your sheep, you had feasts, and you were supposed to welcome people in to your midst. It was a time of hospitality. But there was also an unwritten rule that those who had helped you along the way received some of your spoils. So those who may have helped you with the flocks, those who may have helped you along the way and kept kept you safe, they were supposed to get a thank you note and a little gift. Those of you who are good at writing thank you notes, Nabal wasn't either, apparently. So we see that David sends his servants to Nabal, and he says, Hey, Nabal, the time has come for you to repay our kindness. He sends his compliments he sends his reminders of all that he and his men have done for Nabal. Even though Nabal hadn't asked for help, they, he had gotten it. He had gotten a lot of help. And later on, we will read that everything David said was true. We'll, see, we'll hear from one of the servants of Nabal that this was actually a true story. But David's, uh, David receives kind of a harsh answer, doesn't he? Nabal's like, uh, nah, nah, dog, nah, that ain't happening. His reply was ungracious, it was selfish, it was disrespectful. Other than that, it was perfect. A reciprocal act of goodwill in exchange for the protection that he was given was the right thing to do. It was the correct thing to do. But giving a disrespectful answer to 600 hungry fighting men, that's the definition of foolish. That's the definition of foolish. In fact, it's just plain stupid. Now, here's a basic principle to remember for all you. If you meet a man who is going to be king one day, and he asks you for some lamb chops, hook the man up. Hook the man up. Because one day, he's going to have some power. He's going to be making the rules. But Nabal doesn't care. So he refuses to sh show kindness to David, even though he clearly knows who David is, right? He says, who is this David? Okay, I'll give you that. Maybe you don't know who David is. But then the very next sentence, he tells us that he does know who he is, right? This son of Jesse. So not only does he spit on David, he spits on David's family. He talks junk about his daddy. That's almost as bad as talking junk about his mama. 
You don't do that. You don't do that. It was a big mistake. David's not the kind of man who's going to overlook something like this, at least not right now. Remember, life is going rough for David, isn't it? David's on the run. David's supposed to be king, but he's fearing for his life. His mentor is dead. He hadn't seen his family. Things are stacking against David. So now's not the time to be trifling with him. We'll see. So that leads us to part two. Black screen. Part two. The overreaction of David. The overreaction of David. Picking up in verse 12 here. David's men retraced their steps. When they returned to him, they reported all these words. And he said to his men, all of you, put on your swords. So David and all his men put on their swords. About 400 men followed David, while 200 stayed behind with the supplies. You can see David's response to to, to Nabal's harshness was pretty doggone simple, wasn't it? He said, put on your swords. I love the, 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 the succinctness of that answer, of that cry out. Put on the swords. Friends, put on the swords that mean let's go ride out and have a little powwow and maybe do some talking over who's right and who's wrong. That means business is about to go down. Furniture's about to get moved up in there. Put on your swords. We're about to do this. So things are about to, about to get bad. And we can, we can analyze this re, his reaction well, this way. He had a good reason to be angry, right? He had a good reason to be angry. And, and in this point in time in his life, it makes perfect sense. But he had no right to seek revenge, did he? He had no right to seek revenge. He's the anointed king. He's having to live in hiding rather than in the palace. It's easy to see why his patience is in short supply. But that don't make it right. He'd have been better off just saying, this guy's a jerk. Let's forget about this. Let's move on. We'll find other means to support ourselves. But he didn't do that. Remember just a few days earlier, just a few days earlier, he had gotten the drop on Saul, the man who was trying to kill him, the man who hated him, the man whose place he was going to take soon, and he had chosen not to strike out at him. And now he comes across this Nabal who basically just spits on him a little bit. He doesn't try to kill him. He doesn't try to hurt him. But then he blows up and he's filled with rage and he sees red. We do that sometimes, don't we? We, we? we have somebody lash out at us and we can't get them back. We can't pay them back. We can't dole out the revenge we want to dole out. So we wait for the next person that comes along that we have a little bit of power over and they jerk around with us and then we boo, blow up on them. Shake your head if you know what I'm talking about. David's doing that right, right now, right? David's doing that right now. Nabal's a, Nabal's a lesser man. He's a nobody. But David the merciful has now become David the vengeful in just a few days. Just a few short days. The shock of the story isn't that a jerk acted like a jerk. Friends, newsflash, jerks sometimes act like jerks. I know, if you don't get anything else, get that. Sometimes jerks act like jerks. The shock of this is how quickly a patient and God-fearing man can go from passing up revenge to seeing red and ready to strike down in anger. That's the lesson here, friends. The lesson is that good people sometimes do bad things when they're overwhelmed, overcome with emotion. And if someone doesn't talk sense into him here, David's going to do something rash, right? He's about to make a mess, figurative and literal. Fortunately, there are other characters here. So that leads us to part three, the wisdom of Abigail. The wisdom of Abigail. The stage is set for massacre. Blood is about to be shed. But that's when Abigail comes to town. Starting in verse 14, let's read it together. One of Nabal's young men informed Abigail, Nabal's wife, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, but he yelled at them. The men treated us well. When we were in the field, we weren't harassed, and nothing of ours was missing the whole time we were living among them. It was like they were a wall around us both day and night. The entire time we were herding the sheep. 
everything they said was true, right? David said, go ask your men if you don't believe me. Or he had his men say, go ask them. His men are confirming everything David had said was true. These guys protected us. We didn't even ask them to, and they formed a hedge of protection around us. Now, consider carefully what you must do, the servant says to Abigail. Because there is certain to be trouble for our master and his entire family. He is such a worthless fool that nobody can talk to him. I'm going to stop right there. And I'm just going to just say, friends, you don't want anybody to say that about you, do you? It's funny, but it's true. I don't, I don't want anybody to say, that Jimmy, that's a worthless fool. You can't talk to him. And you don't want anybody to ever say that about you, do you? Okay, sorry. I just want to throw that in there. Felt strongly about it. So the servant here, he has enough sense to know furniture about to get moved up in there. Something bad's about to happen. And he better try to head this off at the pass. So what does he do? He goes, find, goes and finds the smart one. He goes and finds Abigail. So Abigail hurried, taking 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five butchered sheep, a bushel of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of pressed figs. And she loaded them on donkeys. She knew now what David had come and asked for. She knew he had all these men out there. She knew they were hungry. She knew they were hot. They were tired. So what does she do? She feeds them. Brilliant. Who would have thought? She feeds them. She, she intends to intercept David and his men feed them, and then talk them out of killing Nabal and the family. Then she said to her male servants, go ahead of me and I'll be behind you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. Smart lady. As she rode the donkey down a mountain pass hidden from view, she saw David and his men coming toward her and met him. David had just said, I guarded everything that belonged to this man in the wilderness for nothing. He was not missing anything, yet he paid me back evil for good. May God punish me and do so severely if I let any of his men survive until morning. So we we see what's going on in David's mind. He tells us. This is not like 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 a narrator. This is David saying, I feel like I wasted my time. We should have taken some sheep before. I'm killing them all. And God strike me down if I don't get this done. Pretty clear, right? Revenge is bubbling forth in his mind. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off the donkey and fell with her face to the ground in front of David. I love this. Rich woman falls on her face, treats this man, this servant, this leader of a ragtag band treats him like he already has the position that he's going to one day have. Treats him today the way she sees he will be later. You see that? There is a lesson here, ladies. You can look at your man. This is a secret. Tell him this. Honey, you're so strong. It's going to be great when you take the garbage out in a little while. And he just has to do it. He can't help himself. We dumb. <laughs> I'm kidding about most of that, but not the part about us being dumb. We are dumb. <laughs> Just kidding. She fell at his feet and said, the guilt is mine, my Lord. Look at that. She's, all, she's calling him Lord. She's the, the lady, right? She's married to the Lord. This guy's a nobody. So far. And she's going ahead and calling him who he's going to be. She looks at him how he's going to be. She calls him what he's going to be. My Lord. But please let your servant speak to you directly. Who's who's, who's she talking about when she says your servant? She's talking about herself. Like she has completely changed the roles here for us, right? She's the lady and he's the, the, the dirty guy. And she's treating it like he's the the king, the Lord, and she's the dirty person, the servant. Cool, right? 
Listen to the words of your servant. My Lord should pay no attention to this worthless man, Nabal, for he lives up to his name. Remember what his name says? Fool. His name is Nabal, and stupidity is all that he knows. I, your servant, didn't see my Lord's young men whom you sent. Please, please, if I'd have seen it, this would have gone differently. Don't punish us all because of him. Now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, and as surely as you yourself live, it is the Lord who kept you from participating in bloodshed and avenging yourself by your own hand. You want to talk about tricks? This is some Jedi mind trick stuff. These are not the droids you're looking for. Thank God that you didn't kill all those people. He's like, thank God I didn't kill all those people. She's like, yeah, he intercepted you. You don't have to kill him. And David's like, God intercepted me. I don't have to kill. It was like she's doing a mind, you know, she just waves her hand in front and says, thanks be to God that you aren't going to kill those people that you're about to kill. You You see what she's doing here, right? You see what she's doing. I I just love it. It's great. The Lord kept you from doing the stuff you were planning. He hadn't changed his mind yet, y'all. He hadn't changed his mind yet. But she's looking at him like she knows he's going to be. He's going to be king. May your enemies and those who want trouble for my Lord be like Nabal. Accept this gift your servant has brought to my Lord. And let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive your servant's offense. For the Lord is certain to make a lasting dynasty for my Lord because he fights the Lord's battles. Throughout your life, may evil not be found in you. See, hear what she's doing here? She's saying, David, remember, you're a good man. You're a good man. You follow God. You do his will. You don't want to be involved in yourself in the the, the striking down of innocence. You are a godly man. And now is your chance to show the world. When someone pursues you and attempts to take your life, my Lord's life will be tucked safely in the place where the Lord your God protects the living. She's referring to Saul here, right? Everybody knows about Saul and David. Everybody knows what's going down. And she says, God has got you in his hand. He has taken care of you. He is not going to forsake you. And then she says this. However, he will fling away your enemies' lives like stones from a sling. More genius. What do you think she's doing here? You think this is just a coincidence she's talking about slings and stones? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. She is reminding him, I believe intentionally, of his victory just a few short years before when he was younger. Of slinging that rock from that sling and killing Goliath with it. She is taking his mind right back to the time when God guided him to victory. Man, I told you she was smart, didn't I? This is is good stuff. She says God was with you then. He's not going to leave you today. When the Lord does for my Lord all the good he promised and appoints you ruler over Israel, there will not be remorse or a troubled conscience for my Lord because of needless bloodshed or my Lord's revenge. Here's the rub in this whole part, y'all. She's essentially asking him, when you look back on this and tell this story, what kind of story is it that you want to tell? Friend, that is a good question for us to ask about today, about tomorrow, about our lives. When these things that we do are stories that we tell, what kind of stories will we tell? Will they be stories that we are proud of or ashamed of? And what she's saying right here is if you ride these donkeys down that hill and kill those men, You're going to still be king one day, and you're going to look back, and you're going to tell this story, and it's going to bring shame on you. It's going to bring shame on your house. It's going to bring shame on your family. Is that that the kind of legacy you want to leave? Friends, this is what Abigail is asking us today. What kind of legacy do we want to leave? When this is a story that we tell, what kind of story do we want to tell? And because... Of the courage 
and the wisdom of Abigail, he begins to see. And when the Lord does good things for my Lord, may you remember me, she says. May you remember me. She diffuses this deadly situation. She reminds him again that he's going to be king. And when that happens, little pipsqueaks like Nabal will not matter. And David sees the light. David said to Abigail, Praise to the Lord God of Israel who sent you to meet me today. Your discernment is blessed and you are blessed. Today you kept me from participating in bloodshed and avenging myself by my own hand. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord God of Israel lives, who prevented me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, Nabal wouldn't have had any men left by morning light. See that? Hadn't been for you, they'd all been dead. Then David accepted what she brought him and said this, Go home in peace. See, I have heard what you said and have granted your request. Friends, what Abigail does here is she saves David from himself. Friends, sometimes, sometimes we need to be saved from ourselves. I told you a few weeks ago that sometimes we're our own worst enemy, right? When we talk about Samson. And sometimes David and you and me are our own worst enemies. And we need people like Abigail in our lives to help us, to guide us back to the light, to remind us that we don't want to have to tell this story when it's a story that we tell. That leads us to point four. Part four, the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. Then Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was in his house, holding a feast fit for a king. Nabal was in a good mood and very drunk, so, he didn't, so she didn't say anything at all until the morning light. Let's stop right there. So we've got the king, essentially the king-elect, hiding in the woods, just asking for a pork chop. Hungry, needing a raisin cake or something up in there. And can't get nothing. And we got Nabal the fool just having a king-like party. Just drinking, partying. You see the contrast here? Nabal's the fool and he's having the party. She comes back home and she sees him and she's like, I better not tell him now. Because things about to get ugly. So she didn't say anything to him until the morning light. In the morning when Nabal sobered up, his wife told him about these events. Then he had a seizure and became paralyzed. <laughs> it's not funny. About ten days later, the Lord struck him dead. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said this, Praise the Lord who championed my cause against Nabal's insults and restrained his servant from doing evil. The Lord brought Nabal's evil deeds back on his own head. Then David sent messengers. Let me stop right there. Let's talk about that for a second. Nabal comes to a fitting end, right? He gets what he deserves. And David says as much. David says, I wanted the opportunity to take revenge, but you did it for me, God. Thank you. Thank you. Nabal got what he deserved. He got what was coming to him. He got justice. Then David sent messengers to speak to Abigail about marrying him. Because <laughs> I mean, that's what you do when a beautiful single lady keeps you from committing murder. You marry her. I guess. When David's servants came to Abigail at Carmel, they said to her, David sent us to bring you home, to bring you to him as a wife. So she stood up, she bowed her face to the ground and said, Here I am, your servant, to wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Then she got up quickly, and with her five female servants accompanying her, rode on the donkey following David's messengers. And so she became his wife. That's a cool way to end the story, right? Like, they live happily, well, maybe not, I don't know. But it's, it's, this, it's this divine justice that we see here. Right? Nabal gets what he, what's coming to him, but also Abigail does too. Abigail gets what's coming to her as well. She gets rewarded by being 
first of all, rid of that jerk, the foolish jerk, foolish, hateful jerk. And now she's going to be the wife of the king. Friends, this is a great story. It's ready-made for TV or the movie screen. It's got everything. It's got intrigue. It's got betrayal. It's got potential murder. It's got, it's got people dying. It's got, like, romance. It's got it all. I love it. And I also think that it has some takeaways for us. I pointed a few of them out as we went through. But there's a couple more I didn't point out that I, I want us to just fix our eyes on here for just a couple of minutes. These are, these are the two takeaways. This is, this is what this story means to us. The first, the first thing it means is, is that revenge is for the foolish, y'all. Revenge is for the foolish. If not for the intervention of Abigail here, David would have made a mistake that would have marred his future. Friends, I'm telling you, revenge never, ever works out the way that you think that it will. It never, ever works out the way that you want it to. We think we're going to get even. We're going to settle the score. We're going to give them a dose of their own medicine. We're going to measure out eye for an eye. We're going to go tooth for a tooth. We're going tit for tat. We're going blow for blow. It's so tempting, but you know what? It never ends well. I brought, up, I brought up Samson just a minute ago. Remember Samson and their revenge fest? How many innocents had to die because of that? Revenge never ends the way that we think it will. When we get even, what happens? It never stops. And chances are, it's somebody you really don't want to be even with anyway. And not only all that. It's just wrong. We can never be sure our punishment is just. We don't know all the facts. And when we seek revenge in life, what we're doing is we are usurping God's authority. We are blocking His ability to work in someone else's life. Either we let God do it or we do it. Friends, God is much better at being God than we are. It's His job. So let's leave the justice to him. Leave the justice to God. Friends, he carried out the ultimate justice on the cross. Remember that person that hurt you? That sin was already paid for at the cross. Remember that person that stabbed you in the back? That person that let you down? That person that talked about you? That person that hurt you? Friend, that sin has already been paid for at the cross. Remember the things that you have done to someone else? That time you dropped the ball, that time you stabbed somebody in the back, that time you talked about somebody, that time that you hurt somebody? That sin's been paid for at the cross too. That's the justice. Those sins have already been paid for. So the next time you want to seek revenge, friend, don't. Just don't. Instead, try this. Forgive. We forgive because God has forgiven us. Not because the person is worthy of forgiveness. Not because they are worthy of our time and our heart break, but because we have been forgiven. And our affronts to Him are way worse than their affronts to us. You with me? Forgive because God will decide what kind of earthly justice is necessary. It's not our job. First Peter says this, Do not repay evil for evil or insult for insult. Revenge is for the foolish, y'all. And, and point number two, yesterday's victories... Don't win today's battles. How long does it take for David to go from patient and godly and righteous to filled with anger and hatred and lust for retribution? One chapter. Just a couple of short minutes for us, I don't know. Not long, that's the point. How quickly David was overcome by anger. Just a short time before, he was a hero. 
He was the anointed king. He was the hero of the nation. He had killed Goliath. He was killing tens of thousands of Philistines. And then he gets the drop on Saul and he righteously spares his life. But how quickly things change. How quickly we can go from a hero to a less than hero. And that that happens to us too, y'all. You may win the battle yesterday and lose it today. You may have patience today and snap at your child tomorrow. You ha- may have patience tomorrow and yell at your spouse the day after. You may, you may be righteous today and fall tomorrow. Yesterday, it's great if you win the battle, but that don't mean the battle's over. It comes again and again and again, and we have to continually fight it. We have to continually give it to God. We may conquer in a moment of enormous temptation and then lose in a tiny skirmish tomorrow. Friends, the point is this. Don't rest on your laurels. You are not a finished product. You are not who God intends you to be. You're better than you were yesterday, but you ain't there yet and neither am I. Let's don't pretend like we are. You with me? So there's three main characters in this story. Nabal, David, and Abigail. And we are so used, like I said, to the men being the hero. We're also used to David being the hero. But who's the hero of this story? Certainly not Nabal, right? He's not the hero. He repaid evil with evil. That's the definition of a bad person. Or he he repaid good with evil. He had good things done to him and he returned it with evil. If you want to be an evil person, if you want to be a bad guy, that's your blueprint right there. I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it. It's also not David, though. See, David had evil done to him, and what did he want to repay it with? More evil. That was accepted. That was the way of the world. It's the way things happen. It's eye for an eye. It's tooth for a tooth. It's the way things really work. But that's not what heroes are made of either. People who return evil for evil. We can do that easily. But that's not who we want to be, friends. That's not who we want to be. Fortunately, there's Abigail. Abigail's the hero because she repays evil with good. You see that? She repays evil, the evil that Nabal does, that David wants to pay her with. She comes along and does good. Friends, that's counterculture. That's different. If you want somebody to look at you and say you're different, man, what is different about that guy, that girl, that man, that woman, that kid in school? That is the way you tell the world that you are different. You repay good, you repay evil with good. When people try to hurt you, love them. When people try to throw things at you, catch them and lay them down. Build something with it. That is counter culture, friends. Her response, her judgment are remarkable. She is so far ahead of her time. She's like a thousand years ahead of her time. Because you know what? A thousand years later, a thousand years later, a man comes along by the name of Jesus. And he says, this is the way I want my followers to live. When somebody slaps you in the face, I want you to give them the other cheek in case they want to get that one too. When he, he says, when my followers have somebody come along and they make them walk a mile, when a, when a Roman soldier makes you walk a mile, here's what I want you to do. I want you to walk a second mile because you want to. When somebody comes along and they don't have shoes and they talk j- garbage to you, give them your shoes. That's who I want you to be. He changes the world in Matthew 5 when he utters these words. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Friend, that's easy. That's easy. It's easy to love the one who loves you. But I tell you this, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do that? Anybody can love people that are easy to love. You see he's saying that? And if you only greet your brothers, what are you doing out of the ordinary? 
Even the Gentiles do the same. Even the people that don't know me do that. But this is what I'm saying. Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Friends, refusing to respond in kind is one of the hardest things that we do. But listen to me, friend. Listen to me. It's one of the most Christ-like things that we do. It's one of the most Christ-like things that we can do. When we do that, we are more like Christ than any other time. If you tell me, I want to be more like Jesus today, I'm going to tell you how to do it. Love your enemy. Repay evil with good. To respond to someone who does not love you. To respond to someone who wrongs you. To respond to someone who hurts you, whether on purpose or accidentally. To respond in love. I'm not talking about just ignore the offense. I'm not talking about just let it go. I'm talking about respond in love. Respond in love. Friends, that's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do to respond like Abigail. That's what Jesus has called us to. This is what it means to be a follower of him. This is what God has done for us. He looked at our evil. He looked at my evil. He looked at my evil. And he responded by doing, by giving the ultimate good to that evil. Do you see that, friend? Do you see that? He proved his great love for us that while we were still sinners, not just not Jesus followers yet, we were as far from him as the east to the west. He saw us like that and he still loved us. He loved us enough to send Jesus. Friend, that is the ultimate good for the ultimate evil. And Jesus has done it for us, all of us. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Friends, this is big. This is good news. It's good news. Let me tell you one quick story. After the collapse of the Berlin Wall back in 1989, Germany was once again united. Remember? Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. That sounded nothing like Ronald Reagan. But he did. The wall came down and... Germany was unified. There was no person in this one free total country who was more hated, though, than the former president of East Germany, the former communist dictator named Erich Honecker. He'd been stripped of all his offices, and even the Communist Party wouldn't take him in. They liked to wash their hands of all of it. He was kicked out of his home. The new govern- government refused him and his wife a place to live. He was homeless. He was destitute, he and his wife. But there was a Lutheran pastor by the name of U. Holmer. U. U. W. E. U. Holmer. He was. He was a pastor north of Berlin, and when he heard about the Honecker situation, he and his family didn't just let them stay at the church. They opened up their home. They opened up their home to this communist dictator. Eric Honecker's wife, Margot, had been in charge of East German, the East German educational system for 26 years previous. Pastor Homer had 10 children, and eight of them had been turned down from going to public schools of higher education because of the hatred that Mrs. Honecker and this administration had for Christians. They were hated. They were not even allowed to use the public universities because of her policies. They were discriminated against completely. And now the Homers were caring for them in their own home. This most hated man in Germany, this man who had personally hurt this family. And they opened up their home to their enemy. By the grace of God, the homers loved their enemy. They did them good. They blessed them. They prayed for them. Friends, they turned their other cheek. They gave them their coat. They gave them their very home. They did this to people that certainly would not have done it for them. Years before or even now. Why did they do it? Why did they do it? Imagine living in a godless country that persecutes Christians. Receiving that persecution directly on you and your family. And now having an opportunity to respond. And doing it by opening up your home. Your very home. Do not repay evil for evil. Friends, what the homers do here is they live out the Scripture. Can we do that? What would it look like if we 
did that, would we have been able to take them in? Would we have been able to open our doors? I have no idea. But I'm telling you this, this kind of life is the one that God is calling you and me to right now. This kind of life that responds to evil and hatred and wrongdoing and affront and betrayal with love. This is exactly what God is instructing us to do. So what would it look like for you to return good for evil? What would it look like for you to be a blessing for someone who hurts you? That, that estranged parent, that former spouse, that frenemy at work that always throws you under the bus? What would it look like to be a blessing for that person? Not just to ignore them, not just to ignore the offense, but to truly love them. How would that look? How would that look? Friends, this is the gospel at work. And that's my challenge to you today. Be revolutionary. Be out of here. Y'all pray with me. Lord God, we come to you today, and, and we just thank you for stories like this that we may have never read before, but that do speak to us. God, help us to be Abigail. Help us to be Abigail today. Respond to the evil that is done to us in this world with love. Respond to the, to the hurt that is given to us, not with, not with ignoring but with love, with real love. Help us to, to live your gospel. God, that is the clearest way that anyone will see that we are different, is if we respond to evil with good. Help us to do that. It's what you're calling us to. I believe it with all my heart. So help us to respond to evil with good. It's hard. It's hard to even think about loving people who don't love us. But you've called us to it. Now help us to do the hard thing. Help us to do the hard thing, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all stand.
song called All My Hope. I hope you like that one because uh, we've been working on it for a few weeks. Um, if you like it, we'll do it again. Not right now, but maybe maybe do it again next week, you think? <laughs> All right. All right. We'll, we'll keep doing that one. All right. We got one more song. It's called Signature Divine. Kids are coming in, and, and y'all uh, tap your foot with this one. Thank you.